good morning. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians this morning. If you're using a pew Bible, you can find our passage on page 683 this morning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through chapter 3, verse 5 this morning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 through chapter 3, verse 5. And as you find your place in your copy of God's Word, if you'll stand with me as we honor the reading of it. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. The Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. God, may this this passage, by the power of your spirit, convict us and cause us to think deeply about our prayer lives. And Father, I pray that as we are encouraged and exhorted to be a prayerful people, that you will build up your church. Father, help me to be faithful to the passage, and I pray your spirit would cause your word to take root deep in our hearts, and we pray these things in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Now, what is the cause of most backsliding? I believe one of the chief causes is neglect of private prayer. I can only give my opinion as a minister of Christ and a student of the heart, But that opinion is that backsliding generally first begins with neglect of private prayer. Bibles read without prayer, sermons heard without prayer, marriages contracted without prayer, journeys undertaken without prayer, residences chosen without prayer, friendships formed without prayer. The daily act of private prayer itself hurried over or gone through without heart These are the kind of downward steps by which many a Christian descends to a condition of spiritual palsy or reaches the point where God allows him to have a tremendous fall. That was 19th century pastor J.C. Ryle speaking, of course, on prayer. Prayer is one of the most difficult spiritual disciplines, right? That's where you nod your head, yes, yes. If you're like me, then you probably struggle with being consistent in your prayer life because we're busy, we're distracted. We may not know exactly what to say in prayer. We may simply dismiss it. And yet prayer is at the heart of the Christian life. It's why we pray so much in our worship service. But today I want us to think not so much about our corporate prayer, but about our private personal prayer life. Prayer ought to be like breathing for the Christian. It it should be natural and automatic. And yet for many, it's not. It's hard. It's a struggle. It's a wrestling match. And so, as is often the case with difficult things, it's neglected. 
The Spirit and the Word tell us that we need to be faithful and we need to be diligent in our prayers, but, but sometimes we just don't know how. We don't know how to pray, and, and that's a problem because, as J.C. Ryle pointed out, if we're not a praying people, we will certainly not be a steadfast and persevering people. But I think if you're a Christian, you'll readily agree that prayer is important. But how do we begin? And, and I think for most of us, this is where the problem lay. Because most of our, our prayers are, are probably focused on physical issues. Probably focused on health or finances or work. If you were to examine your own personal prayer life, you might find that these are the only things that you ever pray about. Health or, or finances or, or work for a, a friend or a neighbor. And, and when that's all we ever pray for, that, that sister so-and-so will get over this illness or that brother so-and-so will, will find a, a, a new job, if that's all we ever pray about, then our prayer life will understandably become stale and boring. But if you examine the prayers of Scripture, you're going to find that the saints of old focused on different matters in their prayer life. They focused on different matters than, than what we often do. Now, now this isn't to, to say, to deny the need that we should pray for those who are sick. So don't come at me saying, well, shouldn't we ever pray for people who are sick? That's not what I'm saying. I'm not denying that. But... The reality is that we are all going to face physical needs. Some of you will experience long-term repeated sicknesses or physical troubles that will never go away. That's just the reality of our fallen world. Should our prayers focus only on relief from pain and suffering? Or do the scriptures instruct us to pray for more eternal things? Do they teach us to pray that those who suffer might respond faithfully and biblically in the midst of their pain? That those who suffer might be steadfast and look to Christ when all hope seems lost? Our merciful God has given us the scriptures and this passage in particular for us this morning that we might examine the, the kind of prayers that we ought to be praying, the kind of prayers that, that we should, should try to cultivate in our prayer life. And it's, it's more than just prayer for relief from suffering. It's praying and, and giving us a model for how to pray for those who are suffering that they might have hope and they might have encouragement and that they might persevere in the midst of their suffering. The books of First and Second Thessalonians are letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. It's a, a church that he planted in Acts chapter 17. Uh, Thessalonica was in Macedonia or northern Greece. If you look at a map, you can see it in northern Greece. It had been founded by the Macedonian general Cassander in 315 B.C. And it was named after Alexander the Great's stepsister, Thessalonike. It was a moderately sized city of a few hundred thousand, and it was the seat of the Roman government in Macedonia. It was called the mother of all Macedon. The church there had experienced persecution from its very inception. Um, if you look back at Acts chapter 17, you'll see that as Paul preached the gospel, that the unbelieving Jews, they, they started riots they actually brought one of the early converts, Jason, before the city authorities on trumped-up charges of disloyalty to Caesar. The hostility in the city became so severe that the church sent Paul and Silas away by night. The, the trouble didn't stop there. Upon leaving the city, Paul and Silas, they traveled to another city, Berea. But when they heard of the success of the gospel in Berea, the unbelieving Jews from Thessalonica, they traveled to this other city in order to harass and persecute Paul and the Christians there. And so Paul writes 1 Thessalonians to comfort and to encourage the suffering church. If you look at 1 Thessalonians, you'll see that the, the major emphasis is on comfort and, and, and steadfastness in the midst of persecution. 
However, not only did the Thessalonians experience physical persecution, but they also experienced doctrinal confusion. And so we come to 2 Thessalonians, and, and we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we, we see that someone impersonating the Apostle Paul has sent the church a letter. And in that letter, they taught that the day of the Lord had already come. Can you imagine the, the pandemonium that would have followed upon receiving and reading such a letter? The day of the Lord. This great eschatological event wherein Jesus would come to both judge the wicked and to save his people. It's come. And you've missed it. If the Thessalonians have missed the day of the Lord, then what, what hope do they now have? They're suffering. But if they've missed the day of the Lord, then what relief can they now expect? And so in response to this bogus letter in, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, Paul teaches them about the true doctrine of the day of the Lord and that certain things must transpire before Christ comes. The, the man of lawlessness and this great apostasy or falling away have to occur first. But he doesn't just want them to have correct doctrine. He doesn't just want it up here. He wants them to be encouraged. He, he wants them to, to, to experience hope because this confusion about the day of the Lord has caused some of the, the Thessalonian Christians to grow lazy. They've stopped going to work. They've given up on holy living. This laziness was a problem, and we've seen how laziness was a, a, a big problem throughout our study of the book of Hebrews. Laziness will lead to apostasy and spiritual ruin. Paul wants them to persevere. And so what does he do? What does he do in response to this eschatological confusion? Does he break out the end time charts? No. He prays for them. And as he prays for them, he teaches them how to pray. We treat prayer too casually. I, I treat prayer too casually. We know that prayer is important. We know that we should, but we don't. And so, what are you going to do? Prayer is how Paul responds to both physical persecution and doctrinal confusion. It's where his teaching immediately goes when the saints are in need. And it's my hope that we will learn to do the same thing this morning. That we will pray without ceasing and in every circumstance. So in our text this morning, we're going to see four prayers. We're going to see four prayers. And it's my hope that these four prayers will teach us how to pray and that they also will encourage us to pray. These prayers are all about perseverance. They're all about being steadfast in the faith. Because as Paul demonstrates, prayer is absolutely vital to our persevering to the end. You want to persevere to the very end of your Christian life? Do you want to make it? Prayer. Prayer. And that's what I want you to see and to understand this morning. And so we're going to see four prayers for steadfastness so that you might persevere. We're going to see four prayers. A prayer of thanksgiving for salvation. A prayer for strength in good works. A prayer for the success of the gospel and then a prayer for the perseverance of the saints. Those are the four prayers that we're going to see this morning in our text. So look back with me at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And let's look beginning at verses 13 through 15. And we're going to see a prayer of thanksgiving for salvation. A prayer of thanksgiving for salvation. Remember the context of our passage is the doctrinal confusion surrounding the day of the Lord. In verses 1 through 12, Paul remi uh, begins by reminding the Thessalonians of the nature of, of God's steadfast love towards them. He, he calls the Thessalonians beloved by the Lord. So, so in verses 1 through 12, he lays out, this is what's going to happen before the day of the Lord. There's going to be a man of lawlessness and there's going to be a, an apostasy. People are going to fall away. They're not going to believe the truth. And so God is going to send this delusion. And then in verses 13 through 15, he's going to start talking about what God has done for them. And so he begins in verse 13 by calling them beloved beloved. 
by the Lord. And he goes on to expound why they can be sure of this label. Look at verse 13. He, he, he gives thanks and he says, Brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Here we see sovereign love. We see sovereign grace for the Thessalonians. God chose them as first fruits. That's Old Testament language. It, it, in the Old Testament, it speaks of the crops or the produce that were brought before God at the tabernacle and later at the temple. It was an act of worship as the Israelites brought the first of the crops in the understanding that everything belonged to God. They're, they're bringing these first fruits to God recognizing that it is God who has given them everything, that everything belongs to God. And, and so the first fruits here of the, of the Thessalonian Christians, it insinuates that there will be more who will be brought in. There, there will be more fruit. There will be more chosen who will be saved. And, and so we read God chose them as first fruits. And this isn't an arbitrary choice, as we know from reading elsewhere. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In love, with the purpose of blessing the Thessalonians, according to God's wisdom and plan, he chose them. And he chose them to be saved. Now, this is the opposite of what we see in verses 9 through 12. Look, look back up at 9 through 12. The, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. Look at what it says. Because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved, therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Those who love unrighteousness, who refuse to love the truth, will be condemned. But the Thessalonians have been chosen as the first fruits to God, according to God's love and his mercy. They're beloved by the Lord, not to be condemned not to perish, but to be saved. Now, how did God do this? It says that he chose them as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit. In other words, he did this by the Holy Spirit, setting them apart. That's what sanctification means. It means to be made holy. The Spirit comes, God has chosen them, the Spirit comes and he sets them apart as holy. He sets them apart for special use. And it says, belief in the truth or through the gospel, the good news that, that Christ Jesus has died for sinners. So here, here, here's the picture. The, the Thessalonians were chosen by God. He sent Paul to preach the gospel to them. The Spirit made Paul's preaching effectual and those whom God had chosen from among the Thessalonians believed on Christ. There's, there's the order of salvation. It's the, the how of their redemption. From, from before the world was created, before time began, God loved them and chose them. And in time, he sent Paul to preach the truth to them. The Spirit comes and makes the, the truth effectual for them. And those who are chosen by God are saved. And God did this with a goal in mind. Look at verse 14. To this he called you through our gospel so that, here's a purpose statement, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
to this, verse 13, all of, all of verse 13, he called you through the gospel so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The purpose of their salvation is glory. It's glory, and, and not just glory, but the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is, what, this is what it means to be beloved of the Lord. This is steadfast love. This is what the, the Old Testament renders, has said. It's his loving kindness. It's his mercy. It's his grace. His steadfast covenant love has done this. We have the whole picture here in these two verses of the, of the, whole, the whole story from start to finish. Election calling, sanctification, glorification. And notice it's Trinitarian. Notice it's Trinitarian. God the Father chose you through the sanctification of the Spirit to the glory of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what does Paul do in response to this glorious gospel? Go back up to verse 13. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you. How can he not behold what God has done when he thinks upon it? How can the apostle not give thanks? And how can we not? Everything he says about the Thessalonians is true for us as well. They were the first fruits and more have come in. You have come in. God has loved us. We are beloved. He has chosen us. He has sent the gospel to us. The Spirit has given us new life in Christ. And his purpose is to glorify us. God's steadfast love ought to result in thanksgiving for all that he has done for us. But God's steadfast love ought to also result in our perseverance. Look at verse 15. So then, because of, of verses 13 and 14, because of what God has done... So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. In other words, remember what Paul taught in person and remember what he has written to you in his letters. He wants them to be steadfast. He wants them to stand firm. He wants them to be planted like a tree. And Psalm 1 teaches us that it is the one who loves God's law and meditates upon it day and night who will be planted like a tree. So listen to the apostolic teachings and stand firm. These three verses ought to answer any confusion, any doctrinal confusion that they might have because of this bogus letter. They haven't missed the day of the Lord. How could they have? God has chosen them. He has saved them. It is his purpose to glorify them. There's no way that they could ever miss the day when that glorification occurs. And so they ought not to be dismayed. And they should not grow lazy. Paul has already given thanks for their steadfastness. If you look back in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, he says something similar to what we've been reading over in chapter 2. He says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right. Because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. He's given thanks because of, of what they've done in the past now, in 2, 13 through 15, he is giving thanks for their continued steadfastness. And we can have this same hope. Because of the gospel, this will happen for us as well. Does God's steadfast love result in your thanksgiving? Have you considered all that he has done for you? Do your prayers reflect your belief in God's steadfast love? Or are you ungrateful? Are you ungrateful? 
Paul's indictment against mankind in Romans chapter 1 is that although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Are we any better than the pagans? Our hearts ought to practically explode with thanksgiving in every, every circumstance. That's what Paul tells the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Give thanks in every circumstance. We're more, more likely to grumble and complain than to give thanks. Maybe it's because we've been treating the gospel like the gateway into Christianity rather than the sustaining force of our Christianity. We don't think about what God has done for us because deep down we think we can do it ourselves. In fact, many pastors and churches emphasize that you do at least contribute something to your salvation, that you have to make a decision, that you take the first step. And so many of us do believe that we're at least partially responsible for salvation. We don't consider what God has done for us in Christ enough, and, and so we don't have reason to give thanks but remember that you deserve hell. Remember that you deserve hell. Remember that you were once dead in your sins and trespasses, that you used to, to walk according to the pattern of this world. You used to follow after the devil and all of his designs, and you used to follow after your own passions and instincts like an unthinking animal. But the eternal, blessed, only begotten Son of God was slain in our place on a tree so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Oh, saints, give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The more we remember the gospel, the more we respond with thanksgiving for steadfast love, the more steadfast that we will in turn be. Examine your life. Examine your own prayer life, your private, personal prayer life. How much of it is taken up in praise and thanksgiving for all that God has done for you. When we think upon the grace and goodness of God in our lives for all that he's done for us, prayer is not a chore, prayer is a delight. How can we not pray and give thanks for he is good? So think deeply upon all that God has done for you. We are steadfast only because God's love is steadfast. Give thanks in your prayers. That's the first prayer that we see here, verses 13 through 15, a prayer of thanksgiving for salvation. And we could stop right there and you could go to lunch early, but Paul doesn't stop and so we're not going to stop. Look at verses 16 and 17 and see the second prayer. It's a prayer for strength in good works. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, look at what he says, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good word and work. Paul's prayer in these verses, it goes right along with this prayer of thanksgiving. The, the church is experiencing confusion. Their hearts are in turmoil. That They are in danger of falling away. But encouragement will strengthen them and sustain them. He's already prayed in thanksgiving for what God has done for them. Now he prays that God would comfort them. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father comfort your hearts. It's the word for encouragement. Literally, it means to come alongside. May the Lord Jesus and God the Father come alongside your hearts and encourage you. And establish them or, or strengthen them in every good work and word. They're, they're shaken both, both by physical suffering and by doctrinal confusion. Paul prays that God would establish them, that he would plant them in solid ground. They're feeling weak and discouraged. He prays that God would comfort and encourage them. How does God do this? By being the God who loves us. By being the God who gives us comfort and by being the God who gives us hope. Look at verse 16 again. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. 
Now notice that these three things are in the past. God has done all three of these things through the grace of the gospel. We were miserable sinners, ruined by our own rebellion, alienated from God, without hope. But God, being rich in mercy, while we were still dead in our sins and trespasses, he sent Christ to die for us. God has loved us in the gospel. He has comforted us in the gospel. He has given us hope in the gospel. And so Paul prays, and he teaches us to pray as well, to the Lord Jesus Christ and to God our Father, that the Father and the Son and the Spirit might give comfort and establish the hearts of the saints. And he can pray this with confidence because God has already loved us and given us comfort and hope in the gospel. Remember, verses 13 through 14, remember how he gives thanks for all that God has done, that God has chosen them to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he now prays based upon the gospel, based upon what he already theologically knows has happened for the Thessalonians. He prays that God would comfort their hearts and establish them so that they might work, that they might be strengthened to work. Don't skip over the adjectives of verse 16. Christ and, and the Father, they have loved us. And they have given us eternal comfort. Not temporary, not, not fickle, not comfort like the world gives. But eternal comfort. And good hope. Good hope. Again, it's not hope like the world has. A hope that's full of uncertainties. But good hope. Hope that is Sure, may this God, Father, Son, and Spirit, who has loved and comforted and given us hope, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Notice he prays for God to accomplish what he has already exhorted them to do in verse 15. In verse 15, he exhorts them to stand firm and to hold fast to the apostolic teaching. And now he prays that God will comfort and establish their works and their words. And he is sure that it will be so because that's God's purpose for believers. It's God's purpose for you. That you would be comforted. That you might be established. That you might remain steadfast. Now, saints, you may be feeling weak. You may be feeling discouraged. You may be feeling beat up. At the point of leaving the faith to try and, and find comfort and hope somewhere else, don't leave. Don't leave. There's a God who loves you. And he's demonstrated that love through the gospel. There is a God who has given comfort and hope through his grace. And he will comfort your hearts and establish your works so that you will remain steadfast and persevere. Pray that God would do those things for you. Pray that God would do that for you. Pray, Father, I'm weak and I'm filled with sorrow and I, I feel like giving up. Oh God, because of all that you've done, because of all the promises that you've given to the saints, Comfort my heart. Establish me so that I might do good works to the glory of God. And pray confidently. Remember and give thanks for what God has done for us in Christ and his gospel. You can boldly approach the throne of grace through Christ. This is God's purpose for the church and he will do it. And pray for others in this way. Pray for others in this way. Don't simply pray that your fellow Christians will never experience tragedy or heartache. But instead, pray that when they do, and they will, 
Pray that when they experience heartache, when they feel sorrow, when they feel burdened, when they feel bowed down, pray that they might have comfort and that they might be established and that their faith might remain unshaken. Pray these things for our church. Prayer of thanksgiving. A prayer for strength in good works. Now as Paul continues, we're going to ignore the chapter division. And we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. A a prayer for the success of the gospel. The apostle and his co-laborers, they they pray for the church. That's what he, he says in verses 13 through 17. He's praying for the church that they might be comforted, that they might be established. But in his own struggles... He asked that the the church in return pray for them. We should be praying for each other. The church needs to be praying for its pastors and praying for others who labor to preach the gospel. There's two passages I want us to look at very quickly, though there are many that we could look at. Just turn a few pages over to the right to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and you might also... Stick your finger in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. Again, Paul, at the end of his life, this is his last letter to Timothy. He writes this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. We see here the the duties, but also the struggles and the temptations of the minister. We we see in verse 10 about Demas, one of Paul's co-laborers. He's fallen away. He has loved the world, and so he's left Paul, and he's returned to Thessalonica. In in verses 6 through 9, we we see Paul. he's, He's about to die. Not because of old age or because of sickness. He's persecuted to death. And he's been deserted. He's been abandoned. He's lonely. Verses 1 through 5, we read about Timothy and, and Paul's charge to him that he would preach the word of God no matter the reception because days are coming when people won't want to listen. Preach anyway. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Those who, who shepherd, who pastor, who who preach the word of God to you, they have to give an accounting to God for you. We read of of these struggles and these temptations and these trials and hardships. We read about the responsibilities of the minister and how they have to give an account to God. I know how easy it is to grumble and complain about the pastor. I've complained about pastors I've had in the past. You guys don't, don't, you're not the only ones who get to complain about pastors, all right? We certainly are only humans. And we 
probably say and do things sometimes that you might not like. You might not agree with us all the time. That's not a shock to me, okay? You don't have to go around with, with ashamed faces. I know. What the apostle writes here in 2 Thessalonians is instructive for us. We ought to pray for faithful pastors to remain steadfast so that the work of the ministry might be successful. Look at it again. Finally, brothers, pray for us. There's a a simplicity in that request that really struck me as I was studying it. The Apostle Paul is asking for prayer. There's just something... There's just something beautiful about that. There's no one above the need for prayer. If the Apostle Paul needed it, then I definitely do. (laughs) Your pastors definitely do. Because I I don't know if you realize this, but none of us are the Apostle Paul. I don't know if you... What should we pray? What should we pray? He says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. We're to pray that the word may speed ahead. That, That literally means that it may run and be honored. That's the word that's translated elsewhere as glorified. Pray that the word of God, the gospel, might run ahead and be glorified just as it happened in Thessalonica. Paul's testimony about the Thessalonians can be found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. He writes about how they turned from idols to serve the living God. And, and their devotion became so famous that everywhere that Paul traveled, he heard about it. The fruit of their repentance ran ahead of Paul and reached other cities before he actually got there. Do we pray like that? Is that the kind of prayers that we're praying Is the success of the gospel as preached and taught by pastors and missionaries a priority to us in our prayer lives? Is that priority reflected in the way that we pray at home? We pray for each other here. We pray for our brothers in Russia during our pastoral prayer. But what about at home? Do you pray in your daily prayers that the gospel would successfully run ahead and bear fruit? The Apostle Paul asked for prayer. I would ask for your prayers also. Your pastors need your prayers. Pray for your pastor that as he preaches, the word of God prospers. Pray for conversions. Pray that your pastors might see conversions. Pray that your pastor's ministry would see abiding fruit to the glory of God. Pray that your pastors would be encouraged and strengthened and that they would remain confident in the word. That the word, not gimmicks, but the word would be our confidence. Pray that your pastors would continue to see the word as powerful and sufficient, that that your pastors would remember that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Pray that they would not become discouraged, either by those outside the church or by those within. Look at what he says in verse 2. And that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. From wicked, the, the, it literally means out of place. It could be translated as twisted or perverse and evil men. Those who would not only oppose the gospel from without, but who would twist and distort it, just as the Thessalonians are experiencing it through this letter. Because not all have faith. Even in the church, Not all have faith. Sometimes the most difficult situations and the fiercest oppositions your pastors face are in the congregation that they've been tasked with shepherding. 
I know that the times I felt most discouraged and weak have been with, when dealing with church members who have opposed me, both, both openly and behind my back. Opposition hurts because your pastors love you. They love you. And they want the best for you. So pray that your pastors would be delivered from such people. And strive not to be those kind of people. And pray that your pastors won't compromise in the face of hostility from such people. Your pastors need your prayer. It can sound silly to say that it's hard to be a pastor because you probably all have jobs that are hard. But your pastors are watching over your very souls. They will have to give an account to God for how they have cared for you. Your pastors will have to give an account to God for Christ Fellowship Church. This is a heavy responsibility, and so pray for them. Pray for them. Pray that the gospel would run ahead of them and be glorified, bearing abiding fruit. Finally, look at verses 3 through 5. We see a prayer for the perseverance of the saints. A prayer for the perseverance of the saints. If, if as Paul says at the end of verse 2, not all have faith, how can we be confident that we too won't fall away? Well, it's because of the beginning of verse 3. If you write in your Bible, as I encourage you to write in your Bible, underline this sentence, but the Lord is faithful. Not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. Our confidence can never be in our own flesh. It can never be in our own strength or our own will or our own determination because we will fall if it's up to us. But the Lord is faithful. Isn't that great news? As so often is the case, there's debate over who the Lord is here. Is it the Father? Is it the Son? Is it the Spirit? I think it's yes. I think that, like many places in Paul's writings, it's left ambiguous because it's the triune God of whom Paul is writing. It's not just one member of the Trinity who is faithful and who will uphold you. But just as we saw up in chapter 2, verses 13 through 14, how the gospel is triune, so too here. And we see it very clearly in verse 5. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. It's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit together being faithful to you. The Lord is faithful. And so Paul writes, he will establish you and guard you against the evil one. The word establish is one that we've already seen up in verse 17. He will establish you and he will also guard you. This is a, a military term. It's used of, of military protection from a violent assault. You may be shaken and weak, but God is faithful to make you strong and to keep you from falling and to guard you against attacks. And not just any attacks, but he says he will guard you against the evil one. In verse 2, he has requested personal prayer that they might be delivered from evil men. Now he prays that the saints would be delivered from the evil one, the ultimate evil one, the devil. And he's confident that the Lord is faithful and that he will guard the church from the evil one. He, if you go back up to, to chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, you can, you can read there how Paul has already shown that God is sovereign over all the devices and the schemes of the devil. And now here in, in chapter 3, he's sure that God can and will deliver all the saints from the clutches of the evil one. Paul's certainty practically pours out of these verses we've looked at, but he expressly states it in verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. In other words, Paul is certain that God will answer his prayer, all the way back in 2, 
verses 16 and 17. He's prayed that God would establish them in every good work and word. And in verse 4 of chapter 3, he says, we have confidence in the Lord about you that he's going to answer our prayers and you're going to do it. He expresses this same certainty in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. He writes, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. I've often spoke of how I love the way that Paul begins his first letter to the Corinthians. The Corinthian church is a church that you might visit once, but you'd never join. And if you remember that the Corinthians are fighting and breaking into factions, they are tolerating sexual immorality, they're taking one another to court, they even have false teachers who are denying the resurrection of the dead. If you remember all of those things about the Corinthian church, then how he addresses them at the beginning of the letter is shocking. Because the church there is an absolute mess. How does Paul address them? You rotten Corinthians, I'm fed up, I'm done. Peter can have you. No, he, 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 his manner of addressing them is, is surprising. It's, it's even scandalous. Listen, listen to what he, he says in, in 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9. This is a church that, that is filled with all of this... this the sin. I give thanks to my God always for you. And we can just stop right there. Because of everything that he's about to talk to them about, he's giving thanks. Because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, have you lost your mind? Have you forgotten who you're writing to? These aren't the Philippians. Right? These are the Corinthians. You remember, right? Listen to what he says. God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul's confidence, his supreme confidence, is not in the Corinthians. It's in the Lord. But Paul's confidence is also not in the Thessalonians, or the Philippians, or the Lawtonians. It's in the Lord. And it's in his faithfulness. But this confidence that God will answer his prayer and that the Thessalonians will be obedient doesn't leave the Christians any excuse to be lazy and sinful. Rather, it gives them reason to pursue holiness. God is faithful. And they still must persevere and obey. God will do the work. We must work. We see that in Philippians chapter 2. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God will do the work. You have to work. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. God has good works set aside, prepared for you, that we should walk in them. God will work. You must work. So verse 5 is the prayer Paul ends this section with. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. May, may God direct your hearts or cause you to think upon or meditate upon the love of God. This is the love that God has for the Thessalonians and for us. It, it takes us back to the first prayer, our prayer of thanksgiving for salvation. May God direct your heart 
to meditate upon the magnitude of his love. All over the Psalms, we're, we're, we're told that his steadfast love is stretches to the skies. It, it stretches to the clouds. It stretches to the heavens. It's as deep as the deepest parts of the ocean. It, it is immeasurable. May the Lord direct your hearts and minds to think upon this kind of love. But may he also direct your hearts to think upon the steadfastness of Christ. And what does that mean? The steadfastness of Christ. It's the endurance that Christ demonstrated in his life. Here we have our ultimate hope. Christ has already been steadfast for us. He has endured the cross for our sake. We are steadfast because Christ was steadfast in our place. May the Lord direct your heart, cause you to think upon the love that God has for you and the steadfastness of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where perseverance comes from. It's, it's not something we drum up within ourselves. The, the perseverance of the saints, it isn't some kind of work that we fuel within ourselves. It's not something that originates within us. The perseverance of the saints is the response of God's people to the truths of God's word and the effect the gospel has in our hearts. We persevere because of all the truths of the gospel that have already bearing fruit in our lives. Do we pray this way for ourselves? Do we pray this way for others? Do we pray, may, may the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ? Is that what we want for each other? Is that what we pray for each other? If you haven't, begin to pray for those sitting around you even right now. That God might direct their hearts to think upon the love that God has for them in the gospel. And that they might think upon the steadfastness and perseverance of Christ. And pray that your, your brothers and sisters in Christ will persevere to the end. Look at each other. See each other. Do we want to see each other make it across the finish line? Pray for each other. Pray in that way. I pray along with Paul that these two thoughts work in your minds and hearts, that it marinates there, that, that these would be more than just theological categories. It's more than just something in a systematic textbook that talks about the perseverance of the saints. I want you to meditate deeply upon it. That, that these theological truths, they would, they would engage your mind, but they would affect your heart. And they would cause you to walk in a certain way. They would affect how you think, how you feel, what you have affections for, how you live. That by having your heart set and directed towards these things, that, that they cause you to persevere to the very end. And here's hope for saints who struggle in their prayer life. Christ is even now praying for us at the right hand of God the Father. Brothers and sisters, you are not justified before God because you have a stellar prayer life. You are justified before God freely and completely because Jesus, your great high priest, has died for you. So take heart and don't be discouraged. God has loved you and chosen you to be saved through the sanctification of the Spirit so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. He loves us. He will hold us and keep us. And he will one day conform us into the image of Christ. We don't pray so that God will approve of us. We pray in joyful response 
to what God has already done for us in Jesus. We are already approved before God because of Christ. And your prayer life will never change that standing before God. He loves you. And what a privilege we have. Privilege we have that because God has done this for us, we, we can respond in joyful prayer. It's not a chore. It's a privilege. It's a blessing. And if you're here and you've never trusted in Christ, you're missing out on joy. You're missing out on, on privilege, on blessing, a fellowship with God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Oh, today, if you hear his voice, Turn from your sin and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be reconciled to this God. What a joy to think upon these four prayers. May they help us and cause us to remain steadfast. Like I said at the beginning, I, I think we often fail to pray because we don't know what to pray for. I hope this passage has taught you how you can pray. And I, I hope that, that this passage has encouraged you to pray. And I hope you'll be more diligent and faithful in your prayer life. J.C. Ryle, one last time. He wrote, faith is to the soul what life is to the body. Prayer is to faith what breath is to life. How a man can live and not breathe is past my comprehension. And how a man can believe and not pray is past my comprehension too. May we be a people who pray that these things be true in our lives and in our church. May we be steadfast in prayer. That we may remain steadfast in every area of our lives. May we give thanks to God for salvation. May we pray that God would strengthen us for good works. May we pray for the success of the gospel. And may we pray that God would direct our hearts to him so that we might remain steadfast and persevere to the end. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that it both convicts us, but that it also strengthens and encourages and comforts us that where we see our, our own weaknesses and failings and sins in, in regard to our prayer life, that we might be encouraged to pray according to your word. And that we might be comforted that no matter how we might fail it in our prayers, that you love us and that you have sent Christ to die for us and that the Spirit is working in us and he is bringing us home to glory and that you are faithful. You will accomplish these things. God, in response to all of these marvelous truths, cause us to be a people of prayer. Not at, as, as simply duty, but, but as joy May we love to have fellowship with you. May we see you as our only hope. God, I pray that you would do for us according to your will and your purposes as revealed in your word. Work in your people today. Cause us to look to Christ. And we pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.